Our final speaker of the day is Dr. Jim Gaffney of DuPont Pioneer. Dr. Gaffney started with DuPont Pioneer in the fall of 2010 and in his role works on advancing agronomic traits, including those that help crops better use water and nitrogen. Gaffney earned his bachelor's degree from the University of Minnesota, master's from South Dakota State University, and PhD from the University of Florida. He's particularly passionate about improving African agriculture, an interest that dates back to his time as a Peace Corps volunteer in Cameroon, Central Africa, where he worked in agricultural technical school. As a far former farm kid, Gaffney stays connected to his roots as regulatory product strategy lead at DuPont Pioneer. His family raised corn, soybeans, and hogs on their farm in southwest Minnesota, and he stays involved with succession planting to help ensure the farm stays in the family. His presentation today is titled Biofortified Sorghum, Creating Options for African Farmers in the Continent. Everyone, please welcome Dr. Jim Gaffney. So thank you, uh, Laura, for that introduction. And uh, DuPont Pioneer has been getting a lot of uh, thank yous here so far today. I just want to return the favor and say, hey, thank you to the graduate students here at Texas A&M for your organizational skills, your communication skills, the number of emails that we received, and putting on just an excellent uh, show here today. So uh, there's a fair amount of, uh, uh, not redundancy, but maybe review with uh, Kevin Pixley's discussion earlier about uh, biofortification in maize. And uh, really pleased to see that we see a lot of the same types of challenges and also some of the same types of solutions that we have there in Africa. So uh, for today, we're going to talk a little bit about just a, a quick introduction so you know a little bit more about me. Why Africa? Why sorghum? Why do we work on these types of things? Talk about the challenges, the solutions, and then wrap it up with a quick summary. So talking about Pioneer, Henry Agard Wallace, uh, back in 1913, started uh, working on hybrids. And by 1926, he started Pioneer Seed Company. And so this year will be 90 years of Pioneer Seed Company. Um, this little memo here from 1930, I, I, I always find this humorous. This is in our little museum there back in Johnston. And uh, he typed this out in his notes, and then he made some corrections with longhand. Uh, and you know what it says? The best combinations of inbred strains have the ability to outyield the best open pollinated varieties of corn of the same maturity by at least 10%. Okay, so he was really shooting, shooting high there with this 10%. He said, well, some people might quibble, might be a little less, might be a little more. Uh, as we know today, uh, hybrid maize has really taken off and uh, done quite a bit better than 10%. Uh, but in the early years, he had a really difficult time explaining to farmers why a hybrid was better. They didn't really see the value and he was charging more for it. There's no doubt about it. They stuck with their open pollinated varieties until 1934 and 36 when we had some pretty widespread drought. During this period of time, those hybrids that Henry Wallace was promoting out yielded the open pollinated varieties on the matter of 1.5 to 2x to 3x in some cases. At that point on, the hybrids really took off. Uh, and Henry Wallace had a very interesting career. He went on to be Secretary of Agriculture and Vice President under Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, something that couldn't happen today. But uh, as Secretary of Agriculture, Henry Wallace promoted his own hybrids and his own company <laughs> as Secretary of Agriculture. And, you know, if you read about him and his history, it wasn't necessarily because he was just wanted his company to be successful. He was, he was a competitive guy, though. He just truly believed that hybrids were the future, and he, he was passionate about it. Uh, he was an, he, practically an evangelist for hybrids. Uh, so that's a little bit of the history, and uh, we went on then to devote a lot of attention to drought and stress breeding. Uh, starting there in 1957 with a drought breeding station in New York. Um, and we've done a lot of work in this area since then. Uh, so a little bit about me. Uh, as mentioned, uh, University of Minnesota for my undergrad, South Dakota State University, and then University of Florida for my PhD. Uh, in agronomy, 
So I'm not a molecular biologist, I'm not a plant breeder, I'm an agronomist, uh, and I specialized in weed science. Um, so Taba, do you know anybody in the audience, or Taba, do you know if anybody here is from South Dakota State University today? Well, that's, that's, that's too bad, because you know what they say about South Dakota State. Harvard of the Plains. I don't know who they are, but that's what they say. Uh, but it's, it's good to be here. Uh, you know, I'm really uh, passionate about the land-grant university, university system. I think in a lot of parts of the world, and even in the U.S., we, we take it for granted that we have this incredible system. It's the envy of the world in a lot of cases. Uh, we've got to find ways to, to keep it healthy. So I like to see things like this going on when we have a lot of sharing of experiences and sharing of ideas. I think it helps promote the Langer University, University system. So let's get into a little bit about why Africa. Well, it's a big place. You know, the, United, the continental United States can fit within Africa about three and a half times. And as Kevin mentioned earlier, there's still a tremendous amount of arable land that's suitable for agriculture in Africa. A lot of parts of the world, they are suffering from a lack of water resources as well. But in a lot of parts of Africa, they do have good water resources between potential for irrigation and rain-fed agriculture. So there's really a great potential for agriculture in Africa. That's not to say that we want to cultivate every last acre of Africa. There's something to be said for efficient use of resources uh, and intensifying that acre so we can leave some uh, ample natural ecosystems and biodiversity. I think that should be one of our goals going forward. We talk a lot about greater productivity. It's not just about feeding a lot more people. It's about uh, maintaining these ecosystems and, and finding a balance with the environment. Why else Africa? Why else do we work on Africa? Well, it's a young, fast-growing uh, population. A lot has been talked about today in a few talks about the population. Uh, Africa is no different. And Africa probably uh, is maybe a little bit more uh, urgent that we, that we get busy here. Because by 2050, 40% of all under fives will be from Africa. Right? So that means if you do the math and you think about a lot of other countries, their population is either flat or going down, where Africa is still rapidly ramping up. In 80 to 100 years, there's potential for about 40% of the entire population of the world to be African. Right? So we better get busy here uh, and make sure we're doing the right things in Africa to make sure everybody's healthy and moving forward. Sorghum is uh, a very important grain crop globally. Uh, in Africa, uh, it, it is a staple for hundreds of millions of people. The, one of the challenges is, though, it's of low nutritional content. Um, but the beauty of sorghum is it can withstand a, a large variety of environmental conditions, anywhere from flooding and ponding to severe drought and still produce a crop. And these areas where they rely on sorghum, it's not by chance. It's a risk management strategy that's been developed over generations. Extremely important crop to a lot of people. However, like a few others have talked about, uh, it's of low productivity in Africa. So the green line there is millet, the red line is sorghum, and the blue line is maize. Now even the blue line maize, you know, uh, this is West Africa over the last 30 years or so. Uh, it has picked up. There's been a lot of effort devoted to maize, and, and the effort is showing. Uh, even though it's, uh, you know, not quite two tons per hectare yield on average in West Africa, um, it is moving in the right direction. Sorghum and millet, on the other hand, really have not gotten a tremendous amount of t uh, attention in Africa, um, or for that matter, outside of North America for the most part, and, and maybe India would be another place where sorghum does get some attention from a breeding perspective. Um, probably 80% of the African seed sector is the informal seed sector, so locally traded seed, uh, borrowed from neighbors, uh, saved, maybe purchased at the local market in a lot of cases, but always local. That's a very resilient system. Again, it's a risk management strategy. It's a good system in a lot of ways because it, it is stable. 
The challenge, of course, is that that is some very old genetics. And if you believe for a second in climate change or even that the environment is changing in some way, you have to understand that those varieties were probably developed for, a, for an environment that no longer exists, whether it's soil or rainfall or, or what have you, or the climate in general. Um, and in addition to the challenges of just the degrading genetics that occur when you don't update your seed from time to time. So those are some of the things we have going on in Africa with sorghum and millet. Uh, Kevin mentioned the micronutrient deficiencies. Uh, I've got a fairly similar map. Um, this one is about stunting. So you look at Africa and you can see that there's some of the most severe stunting is going on in Africa. And the stunting many times is not just due to calorie deficiencies, because a lot of times there is there are enough calories, it's because of micronutrient deficiencies. Uh, vitamin A and zinc in this particular uh, publication were cited as two of the very worst that are still going on. The problem with micronutrient deficiencies is you don't see them. There aren't these dramatic symptoms until it's too late. Uh, but once these symptoms set in, it's irreversible. And, and it can lead to a lifetime of both uh, physical and mental stunting, uh, socioeconomic status is generally lower, and earning power, good jobs, you know, moving a, a family up the prosperity ladder becomes even more challenging. So vitamin A and zinc are problems, but if you say that to someone that's worked on iron deficiency and anemia, they will say, hold up, iron and anemia are at least as bad as vitamin A and zinc. Uh, if you look at, these are different uh, areas of uh, Africa, East Africa, North, South, West. Uh, really, the lines are flat over the last 30 years. We're not keeping up with the Millennium Development Goals, as Kevin mentioned. Uh, we're making very little improvement in some of these areas. Um, so, again, these are the types of things that, that contribute to a lot of problems that really it's extremely frustrating that we can't do something about this. And we are making progress in other parts of the world, which makes it even more frustrating for why we can't do something in Africa. So I'm a glass half full kind of a guy. I think we can do something about it. Um, and I think we should be doing something about it uh, more than we're doing today. So uh, back a few years ago, 2007, 2008 timeframe, uh, we, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, come, came up with a concept of biofortification. And they were not worried about whether it was through native traits or transgenic traits. And uh, a number of projects were started in maize, uh, beans, sorghum, sweet potato, cassava, and golden rice was probably the, the poster child for biofortification. With, trans, with sorghum, we're working with transgenic traits, and I'll explain a little bit more why we're doing transgenic traits in sorghum. Um, so the, their, the Bill and Melinda Gates uh, Foundation has been the major contributor to this effort. Uh, we're probably second through in-kind contributions, labor, time, uh, you name it. Uh, we've put a fair amount into it. And of course, for any of these projects to be successful, you need strong African leadership. And we have received that from national research, research programs in both Nigeria and Kenya and Africa Harvest, which is a uh, NAP, uh, NGO, non-governmental organization based in Nairobi. So the leadership that we've received from, Kent, from uh, the African countries has been tremendous and it's helped us get where we are today. And that's still the main contributors are our, our African partners. So what we aim to do with biofortified sorghum was increase the beta carotene level or vitamin A, uh, increase the iron and zinc availability, improve the regulatory framework in Africa and build that infrastructure in a number of different ways through capacity buildings. And, and because this is a tr these are transgenic traits, of course, you need to have a regulatory infrastructure in place. Um, we also worked very hard on sorghum breeding and transformation and seed systems. 
and also training and creating awareness and educating and, and trying to build that part of the effort as well. One thing about iron and zinc in sorghum. Sorghum actually contains fairly high levels of iron and zinc in some, some backgrounds. And you can do native breeding for that. The problem is there's a molecule called phytate within the sorghum, which makes that iron and zinc practically unavailable except at low levels. So while we don't worry too much about increasing the levels, although we can do that too, it's more about making them more available to the human digestive system. So these are, over on that, that far left column, these are the genes that we're working with. So uh, the crit I and the Psi1 genes, those are the very same genes that uh, golden rice is using to increase beta carotene in rice. We've also been looking at crit B uh, as, a, as a, another gene that improves the beta carotene levels. HGGT uh, is from uh, barley. Um, and it is, uh, it stabilizes the beta carotene. We'll get into that in just a second. The two rice genes there are about iron and zinc uptake and accumulation in the grain, uh, which we've demonstrated we can do. And then the Phi A gene is for the phytate breakdown. Uh, so when you're thinking, so I'm a regulatory guy. I work in industry affairs and regulatory. My role there is to create a, uh, an aggressive, predictable path through the global regulatory agencies around the globe to get our products, our transgenic products commercialized. So when we think of bringing a transgenic trait through the regulatory system and to commercialization, we look for genes that are ubiquitous in nature, you know, things that have been around us and not caused us any problems for the millennium. Uh, we look for genes that are not allergens. Of course, that would be a showstopper. We don't want any allergens in our products that aren't already there. Uh, ideally, we look for genes that are common in food. Uh, so uh, we then, if you can meet these criteria, we can have something that's called uh, history of safe use standard. Or even better than that, uh, something called uh, generally regarded as safe. Regulatory agencies like these things. All right? So with the genes that we're looking at, we are very confident that we can prove history of safe use and generally regarded as safe. So some real positives here with these genes. Now, going back to beta carotene here for a minute. Now, the, the problem with sorghum is that there's almost no very, it's very low levels of beta carotene to almost zero, and there's almost no variability. So breeding for it is practically impossible with native traits. There just isn't anything there. Uh, what we've been able to do with different combinations of the Psi1, the crit I, and the crit B gene is increase that beta carotene level from, from practically zero to the 50 to 70 micrograms per gram level. So that's, that's pretty attractive to us. We think that can make a difference right there uh, with that. Now, I did notice uh, the other Kevin's talk to this morning with his, his uh, musk melon. He was at 350 micrograms per gram of beta carotene. Now, that's vitamin A. Uh, I noticed that right away because I think about this a lot. Uh, we need to get more, you know, musk melon in Burkina Faso, I guess. Uh, so, the other challenge with beta carotene that's fairly known is that it breaks down rather quickly. Uh, and we did a study where, you know, we looked at the control, we looked at uh, beta carotene in normal air and then beta carotene in ox oxygen. And when you concentrate the oxygen, it breaks down even faster. So obviously that's the challenge is the oxygen. So with our event 198, pretty high beta carotene levels, but no HGGT in it, the half-life is less than four weeks of that beta carotene. When we include the HGGT molecule, or molecule gene, it protects that beta carotene, and the half-life goes up to about 10 weeks. So that's, that, as well, is very significant. You have a higher level of beta carotene, and it breaks down much slower, meaning you can provide beta carotene at a reasonable level for a much longer period of time after harvest, when, that's, when that sorghum is in storage. And the, the issue there is, 
you know, the oxidation is the problem. The HEGT produces the vitamin E, the tocotrienols, which protect that beta carotene from the oxygen. So that was also another breakthrough. Another thing that we did was look at the bioconversion of beta carotene to vitamin A. And because we can't do this in humans yet, we use the Mongolian gerbil. Oddly enough, the Mongolian gerbil seems to have a uh, digestive system for beta carotene and is very similar to humans. This is, this is well documented. Like, so, like Kevin, you get into this stuff and you're, you know, being an agronomist, this isn't my area, but the literature is fascinating. And you talk to more people, you talk to these nutrition experts, it's an, it's an incredible area of study. Uh, and, and we're learning a ton as we go along here. Uh, but it's always good to have the experts uh, on speed dial to talk these things through. So if you look at the, the red line there is our biofortified bio sorghum. The beta carotene conversion in these gerbils is 4.3 to 1. So that's on par with the other grains, including maize, golden rice. Um, the only thing better than the grains would be something like liver. That's a 1 to 1. So if you, it's 1 to 1 beta carotene, beta carotene to vitamin A. Any beta carotene that's in liver is directly useful to the human digestive system. Uh, the green leafy vegetables, the fruits and vegetables, are not nearly as bioconvertible, I guess you'd call it, as the grains. So this is one area where I'll, I'll bring up the dietary diversity issue. One of the big criticisms, criticisms we receive is that our goal should not be this crazy uh, biofortification effort. It should be about dietary diversity. Dietary diversity is the number one goal, no doubt about it. But in a lot of these areas, there just is not enough diversity available today to meet the demands of these micronutrients. There's just no way around it. Americans get a tremendous amount of our micronutrients from meat, dairy, and eggs. Again, not available at any price in a lot of these Sahelian regions where they rely on sorghum. Even if it was available, it would be, require tremendous behavioral changes to get somebody to move from eating a lot of sorghum to eating this, what they would consider a crazy diversified diet. It's just not going to happen in one generation. It's going to be a long process to get there. Obviously, it is the goal. Obviously, we hope to get there sooner than later. But biofortified sorghum offers this in-between step where we can still deliver micronutrients in a reasonable fashion, we believe. So here's the phytate story. So phytate, phytate is ubiquitous in the grain. And as long as it's in the grain, the iron and zinc bind tightly to it and it moves right through the system. Right? And it's unavailable. Now what we found was, if you are not careful, uh, you can also reduce germination of your sorghum if you, re if you reduce phytate. Okay, so of course that's a non-starter as well. Uh, but what we found is through a normal preparation process that iron and zinc can be made available uh, to the human digestive system. So a 90% phytate reduction resulting in greater iron and zinc availability is what we found. One thing else I should mention here, we've worked very hard with sorghum, our, our research team has, uh, on the transformation and trade integration process. And we found that we can go directly into some of these uh, African varieties. Uh, and this really hasn't been done a lot in sorghum. Transformation using transgenic traits uh, really uh, is not going on in too many labs today. Uh, but we've had some pretty good success there as well. So what does this mean through the beta carotene, the bioconversion, the stabilization of beta carotene and the phytate reduction, making the iron and zinc more available. We believe that during periods of time after harvest, we can provide from 50 to 100 percent of beta carotene needs uh, and 80 percent of the estimated average requirement of iron and zinc just through normal consumption of sorghum. And this is 100 grams per day of sorghum. And you think, well, that sounds like a lot of sorghum, uh, but if you are relying on sorghum for your main source of calories, 100 grams is, is not a lot. 
there's plenty of literature available that demonstrates even up to 400 grams per day of grain is some, consumed by adults. So that's not out of the question in any, in any, by any stretch. The other part of what we're working on is seed systems, improving the seed systems in Africa. I mentioned that about 80% of the seed systems today in Africa are of the informal sector. Again, that's important and that's, and that's resilient, but it's resilient at a fairly low level of, of economic, socioeconomic levels. Okay? And when we think of a seed system at DuPont Pioneer, we start with the research and breeder seed, of course, but it flows all the way down to the end user needs and consistent supply. Uh, farmer access and scale is also extremely important to us. I think a lot of times, uh, from a research perspective, we think about the top of that seed system, the research part of it. I would challenge you to think about the other parts of the seed system. Uh, back in just this past October, we had a meeting in Montpellier, France with a, a number of participants from uh, all over the place including donors. Uh, the CG system was representative and we agreed that we were going to focus on seed systems, agronomy, product development, and market and value chains. A big part of the, the challenge in Africa is access by that farmer to inputs and access to the output market so he can sell his excess grain. Uh, and that's part of what we intend to work on with this partnership that we're, we're trying to get moving a little bit here. Uh, that, was a, that was an exciting meeting in a lot of ways. We had a lot of people sitting around the room kind of looking at each other saying, you know, what the heck are we doing here? Uh, uh, it was a little bit anxious at times, but by the end of the meeting, we really had some common ground with a lot of diverse groups, and we hope to really make a business out of this. So back to the regulatory piece again. So transgenic traits require regulatory infrastructure, regulatory rules, uh, to be able to move a product through. Now the green represents countries that have full-fledged regulatory uh, bodies that can move a product through the system. Uh, Burkina Faso has gone through with uh, um, BT cotton. They're working on BT uh, cowpea, I believe. South Africa, of course, has a number of different transgenic traits already uh, commercialized. Uh, Kenya just last week got approval uh, for BT maize for cultivation approval. Now that's not saying it's commercialized yet, but it's a huge step. Uh, and in the regulatory world, that you know gets us pretty excited that Kenya is moving forward. And we think Kenya is going to be one of those anchor countries that are going to pull a lot of other countries along with them. So we're pretty excited about uh, the future of transgenic traits in Africa. So agricultural development at Pioneer. I, I, now and then I get asked questions of why we're working on these things. Um, when in fact there's really nothing directly beneficial to DuPont Pioneer. Well, certainly we're a multinational seed company and we're profit driven. There's no doubt about that. And we don't apologize for that. That's the basis for capitalism and multinational seed companies. That's, that's what we do. Uh, however, I think DuPont Pioneer is filled with a lot of ethical and moral caring people. So that's another reason why we believe we need to work on these things. If we have technology available, let's apply it where it's needed. But there are also a number of other reasons. You know, the professionalism that we believe we can develop uh, with seed system and agriculture in general uh, is a big benefit to everyone, including us long-term our, for our profit-driven needs. Uh, there's greater prosperity that we believe we can contribute. There's a long history of uh, ripple effects when improved agriculture is introduced in the form of hybrids, fertilizer, and better production systems. And the ripple effects uh, create, put more food on the table, put a tin roof on your house, get your kids to school, and then you can start worrying about other things. So incredibly important there. Uh, technology, you know, we've got a tremendous amount of technology at DuPont Pioneer that we're using in different ways uh, that we think can be applied in other ways that we're not using yet. So that's another reason we work on these things. Resources. 
So we look at this micronutrient deficiency challenge in Africa as a, as a huge problem. We can't do that on our own. So how can we collaborate, gather our resources with others, and really make something happen? So another, another issue there is resourcing, doing things that we would not be able to do on our own. And finally, trust. Uh, you know, we believe we're doing the right things around the world for seed production and productivity uh, and efficient use of inputs. But there is a tremendous amount of distrust of multinational seed companies. Uh, you know, some people believe we're trying to control the world's food supplies in different ways. Um, I highly doubt we could do that even if we wanted to. Uh, but if in some small way, through these development efforts, we can create just a little bit more trust and familiarity with what we're trying to accomplish, that's a, that's a big positive for us. So those are a lot of the reasons why we get involved. And I'm just pleased and, and proud to be part of a company uh, where our leadership sees the importance and has a vision and, and is willing to commit to these long-term challenging product problems. Uh, so back to you guys. How does this relate to you guys? Well, uh, thinking of career options and opportunities, it's a big world out there. There's a tremendous amount of options and opportunities that you guys have. You know, I was looking at the, uh, the, the uh, screen roll through of people's uh, dream jobs, and a lot of you have very specific dream jobs already lined up for yourselves or what you want to do. Um, I would, at, at this point in your careers, I would keep an open mind. There's a tremendous amount of things available out there. I know, you know, before I joined Pioneer, uh, I was with a competitor company in Raleigh, North Carolina, and my eventual hiring manager called me one day and he says, so Jim, have you ever considered a career in regulatory? In my head, I was thinking, not just no, but heck no. Not my deal, right? Uh, but I said, but I said, well, you know, I would consider that, sure, you bet. Uh, so I let him talk. Uh, he convinced me that I should at least come out to uh, Johnson for an interview. Uh, and the more I talked to people, the more I, I met people, the more I realized that this could be a very exciting career move for me. Uh, so something that I had never really thought about before in my life all of a sudden became my passion. Uh, and it still is. Um, skill sets for you to think about. I think communication is probably one of the most important things we all need to, to work on. Even if you're a great communicator today, communicator today, you can get better. Uh, oral presentations uh, are hugely important. Your speaking skills, writing skills. Uh, don't be afraid to get that first draft down and get it to your major professor so he can tear it up and get it back to you. I know that's a painful process, but it's a hugely helpful process to learn to write effectively. I think the other thing we do in graduate school and in our professional lives once we leave graduate school is we, we learn to and get very good at talking and communicating to other scientists. One of the things I really challenge you on is learning how to communicate better with non-scientists. A tremendous amount of what we do, we love, and we think everybody else should love it, just because, boy, this is so powerful and it's going to change the world and this is great. But then you talk to somebody that's not a scientist, they don't quite see what you see, uh, and the, the excitement, not only is the excitement not there, but a wall goes up sometimes and they're thinking, you guys are crazy. Why would we do this, All right? Speaking to non-scientists is, is incredibly important. So, and as far as your education goes, you know, I mentioned my commitment, my admiration for the land-grant university system. Uh, you know, once you get that graduate degree, the world is your oyster. There's so many different things you can do. So, you know, take that degree seriously. Take your school seriously. Take your job seriously but maybe don't take yourselves quite as seriously and just let your curiosity take you down the road. So in summary, these micronutrient deficiencies uh, in Africa are a persistent problem and persistent doesn't cut it. It's, they're just entrenched problems, immovable problems in some of these countries. And the, and the problem is it's affecting some of the poorest countries in Africa. I think of Burkina Faso as one of the, it was one of these examples. It's, these guys are trying so hard. You know, I've been there, I've talked to the breeders, I've met the Minister of Agriculture, and they're just 
pleading, saying, you know, come on, let's go, you know, bring us some technology, let's get this thing moving. Um, so we need to do more than we're doing today. Um, the seed system development is absolutely critical. And again, it's not just the research end. I would challenge you guys in this room to think about, when you're thinking about a seed system, think about it all the way through to that end user and that, that farmer and the end user. How can we give greater access and create greater knowledge and awareness at the end user level? And until that happens and until that farmer has access to the markets, everything upstream is practically meaningless. In the next 100 years, there's going to be a huge number of people on this continent that are African. That can be really exciting as long as they're off to a good start. That first 1,000 days from conception to two years of age is absolutely critical to get people off to a good start. And again, in the U.S., you know, Europe, most of us in this room, I think we've taken this for granted. We just expect that we're going to have great nutrition from start to finish. All right? Our biggest problem is overconsumption, not deficiencies. All right? If we can make a difference, this next 80 years is going to be really exciting, not just for Africa, but everybody else that benefits from this big African population. Um, so your role, you know, again, I can't stress enough, <laughs> you know, you guys are lucky. You're, you're in this great educational system. Just the fact that you're here, I would guess that you probably had some nurturing along the line somewhere, whether it was your parents or a teacher or somebody that pushed you to achieve and maybe achieve a little bit more. Uh, you know, you've been taught that hard work pays. Otherwise, there's no way in heck that you'd be in graduate school. <laughs> you don't do that just for fun. Um, and I would guess you're probably uh, at least average to above average intelligence. Just a, just a hunch. So in a lot of ways, you're, you're privileged. If you travel the world, you're the envy of the world in a lot of countries, in a lot of regions. All right? So with that privilege, sorry. <laughs> So with that privilege comes a huge responsibility to, to leave the earth in a better place. So with that, thank you very much. Thank so any you. questions? Yeah. Sorry, I guess, questions? <laughs> I didn't, not sure. I don't know. Not, not sure why I got emotional there at the end. <laughs> My apologies. We have 10 minutes for questions. Let's go over here first. Hi. What do you think is the biggest impediment to getting this technology to other nations? Is it uh, government officials getting in the way yeah. or lack of funding or resistance by farmers? So it's not resistance by farmers. Farmers the world over have demonstrated that when they see a technology and it works for them, and it's demonstrated that it works, they'll jump on it and they'll use it. You know, smallholder farmers, you know, that's another thing where multinational seed companies get accused of, uh, you know, uh, pushing smallholder, pushing technology on smallholder farmers when fa farmers are not ready for technology. That's, nothing could be further from the truth. These farmers, large and small, are shrewd. They're tough, they're risk managers. They're not going to adopt anything unless they know it works for them. So it's not that. Really, it's a combination of, you know, I think it's mistrust of multinationals because historically it's only multinationals that have had the, the means to create these transgenic traits and push them out into the world. So there's mistrust of multinationals. Uh, there, is, there is true mistrust of transgenic traits in some cases. Uh, and I think the Europeans have really uh, fanned that out to, and, and Africa really has to pay attention to uh, Europe in a lot of cases. Um, for different reasons. So that's part of it. Um, and then there's, you know, really boils down to protectionism. You know, I mean, you look at China and the reasons they've created problems in the global grain trade, 
I think a lot of it comes down to protectionism. You know, they at one point they bought a lot of really expensive grain. Uh, then they decided that they were going to look for transgenic traits, uh, and they found them, of course, because they're everywhere. And they said, "Oh, we can't take that shipment because we have not approved that transgenic trait yet." Uh, there's lots of reasons. It's not the farmers. And right now, with with our biofortified sorghum project, we really are uh, out of funding, right? Uh, you know, the Gates Foundation is really I think there's donor fatigue out there. You know, golden rice has taken so long and that's still not on the market. Even though we've really made some big progress here, I think there's just donor fatigue over transgenic traits. All right. Hi, I was wondering, um, you talk a lot about communicating and educating with the community and how involved are they in this process or when do you kind of bring them in on what you're doing? Right. So for this particular process, we've, we've chosen to hold off until we're closer to delivering a real product. We really learned from uh, the banana project, which is another vitamin A project, the golden rice project. Uh, we've looked at what they've done and they, it seems like they've gotten the cart far out in front of the horse. And they made some big promises about what was going to happen before they were ready to, to deliver. And I think it's really backfired on them. So you know, there, there's a number of ways to do effective advocacy and outreach, education and awareness, uh, and it's going to take a big effort, um, but we're going to wait until we're ready when we really have something to deliver. So uh, one of the things I noticed was your yield uh, trends across Africa, and that's really hard data to get an accurate estimate on, but yep. underneath there you said that the sorghum acreage had actually doubled. And so yes. what I'm wondering is if that's sort of confounded with going to more marginal land, so maybe the actual yeah. yield on the other land has increased, but averaged across the marginal land, maybe it's looking flat? Yes, so very good point. Sorghum acreage has doubled, so that's not something I forgot to point that out. It, it has gone up, in, and so you would expect it to go on some marginal acres. Uh, in which case the yield would be held down. Uh, we talked that through at that meeting in Montpellier back in October um, and uh, you know I, I presented the, this, that very same graph back then and of course uh, a couple of groups were a little bit offended by it. that was not my intention but they said the very same thing it's like well look we're, we're growing sorghum where it was, hasn't been grown before so of course we're gonna have bad yields on the other hand, if you look at the University of Queensland in Australia, they've been breeding for sorghum for, you know, I don't know, 40, 50 years now. They've made incredible gains in some of the most inhospital, inhospitable environments on the planet. And there was a guy, uh, David Jordan from Queensland, was at our meeting in Montpellier, and he got up and said, well, look, if we can do it in Australia, we can do it in Africa. And they are actually working in Ethiopia right now on a sorghum breeding project. And they're actually having some success in Ethiopia on some of those very difficult, challenging grounds. So in Australia, in some really drought prone areas, they've shown 4% year on year yield increase in sorghum with just a, a good solid breeding program. So I'm not ready to throw in the towel on and, and use that as an excuse. But good point. So, Jim, it's a great presentation. Uh, I have two questions. One is uh, when you're trying to do this implementation of the biofortified sorghum project, do you consider the shortcomings of the, the rice project and the even the, the sweet potato? What are the shortcomings? Do they the, the consumers and the growers accepted that fact? And also the second question is, when you're trying to implement the hybrid uh, uh, varieties into small farmer holdings in Africa particularly, do you think there is an economic issue that they don't, they're not ready to accept those kind of things? Yeah, so I'll, let me start with that question first, the hybrid and the seed system piece. So hybrids in Africa uh, definitely are challenging. For some of the smallest farmers there, some of the poorest, it's difficult for them to come up with that initial uh, cash outlay. Um, 
So we're not saying it has to be hybrids. When we say improving the seed system, we don't mean to say that, boy, we have to go directly to hybrids and we have to go there right now. Uh, I think what we're saying is we need to take some step changes to get to a point where farmers can afford hybrids and do appreciate hybrids. We do see it in maize in East Africa where some of the poorest farmers do come up with the cash. They do, they can find a way to afford hybrids and then there's a history of them being much better off. So it's not something that's impossible, uh, but that seed system needs to be improved along the ways. There needs to be some stepwise changes. Now your, your other, the first question was about uh, sweet potato and rice and learning from learning from those projects. When you're implementing the biofortified sorghum, are you taking into consideration of the, the, the shortcomings of those previous projects? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, now the sweet potato, I don't see too many shortcomings there. I think they did a fantastic job. They really worked hard on the marketing end of things. Uh, the sweet potato thing I think is a success story. Uh, golden rice, you know, I think early on there was so much hype around golden rice and then there was so much backlash about golden rice. That's what we're trying to avoid there. There definitely were some shortcomings about golden rice. Nothing to do with Erie or their fault at all. Uh, it was just a circus. You know, it was a media circus in a lot of ways. So we are going to learn from that, we hope, and try to avoid that situation. We have time for one more question. Anybody has one? All right, if there's no more questions, thank you again. Oh, one more. Okay, can I receive? Yeah, my, um, just, just to, to add on to what the other professor talked about, you know, golden rice and, you know, bananas and every other thing. Uh, it's still really vague to me how biofortification of sorghum would be really, really, really different from the other uh, shortcomings that we've seen with uh, potatoes and all that, acceptability and all that. I'm not really, really sure whether there are new strategies that are going to be employed to really overcome such challenges. I don't know whether you have maybe some to um, maybe uh, just so, mention a few right now maybe. Well, if you think about the other crops, whether it was maize or um, sweet potato, it was, a, it was a different color. There was something different about it. Um, with sorghum, we do see a slight color change, but in a lot of cases you can't tell a color change anyway because sorghums in general, there are red sorghums, there are white sorghums, there's in-between sorghums. So there's really not going to be that type of apprehension. Uh, there's really no behavioral change needed there. Uh, really what we believe is the, the most important thing, like was mentioned earlier today, is that if you get the biofortified sorghum into a good yielding variety, that's going to be half the battle. Farmers and consumers, these villagers, are not going to get all excited about vitamin A in their sorghum because they're not going to really be able to see dramatic changes in their health. You know, it's not a week to day to day or week to week thing. It's a lifetime thing. So you have to get them excited about other things uh, along the way. A good yielding, high quality, good milling, good porridge sorghum is what's going to win them over. And in that case, there's not going to be, you know, we don't believe there's going to be a big behavior change needed. There needs to be education and awareness around nutrition in general. So that's necessary, obviously. Does that help? Yep, thank you. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Gaffney.